was told a time or another to uh, not speak my language by uh, uh, teachers there, the sisters that were there. They were still practicing the philosophy of, of assimilation. They were mean to the children and, and there was a lot of uh, uh, strapping going on, you know, and, and uh, having books thrown at us. Uh, some of us uh, rebelled uh, against those types of uh, things, and uh, and and we we uh, usually paid the price with a strap or whatever. I guess for me specifically, some days it's harder than others, especially when the boarding school movements started picking up traction. It was something that a lot of non-Native students didn't know Native students struggled with, I think. Because of the tuition waiver, sometimes there's some tension between Native students and non-Native students. And this idea that Native students kind of get things for free and were privileged in certain ways. But <laughs> what comes along with getting the tuition waiver is because of the boarding school history. And that's not something that Native students just, you know, forget about. And they're like, yay, I get free school. I feel like the general lack of education around boarding schools is kind of what motivates people to make comments like that, especially since they don't know that the boarding school is so heavily tied with the treaty of, um, well, I guess, this legally binding stipulation between the University of Minnesota and the Morris campus specifically after it was signed over to them to have um, the tuition waiver be a thing. No one was surprised that children had died here, in other words. And if you talk to um, students or actually any member of a tribal nation, they will say, of course people died at boarding schools. Of course people died here. So we long knew, if you go back to uh, Berta Hearn's 1985 article in the Minnesota, Minnesota History article, um, he talks about deaths here. There are a few where we just don't know. So the disposition of the remains is left up in the air. The traumatic uh, um, things that they've seen is passed on to them. So it, be, it becomes uh, intergenerational impacts of, of boarding school and residential school. I remember overhearing non-Native students when I was in freshman year say like, oh, you know, they just get things for free. Um, there was this kind of resentment and it made me feel bad because I didn't know where it was coming from. And especially since it was my first year kind of not being where I was raised, it made me feel I don't know, attacked. I was just sad about it. If the university or general education in America did a little bit better of a job educating younger students up into college about Native American history, then we would get less um, stereotypical answers towards Native students just trying to, you know, get their degree. Me and my friend Dylan, um, the past summer, because of the boarding school movement that was happening, we thought it would be a good time to push for the school to also search for any remains and if possible, repatriate them to the appropriate nations. It was mainly made as a campaign, not only just to like make demands and kind of be like, you need to do this, why aren't you doing it and whatnot. Um, but also just so that the school has that there and as a reminder and that the Native students who attend feel like they have a voice and that their concerns are being met with the school's boarding school history. I would like people to have that understanding that residential schools were used to assimilate Native people. I don't know, if it's not broadcasted, then how can you move forward with healing and how can the survivors and their descendants get some kind of closure if no one ever talks about it, no one ever knows about it, and, you know, 
things just get covered up and they're like, okay, we can move on. Things happen here, you know, uh, unexplained things happen here. And so we, we needed to um, take care of that spirituality, take care of, of, uh, of sometimes in what we call lost souls. You know, we need to, we have ceremonies like that to send uh, um, uh, individuals home. We know that there were children from multiple tribal nations here, and we won't necessarily be able to identify uh, which, uh, how to send them home. Um, and that will be a complicated process. But I think that is what is crucial is that we do this the way that the tribal nations want to do it and not the way that I might want to do it or the way that somebody uh, outside of this might want to do it. We can uh, um, seek um, a good life. We call it mino bimat ziwin, which means uh, trying, uh, living a good life. And, and that's the goal for many of, of our people. And that's the, uh, the philosophy that they try and take when, when, they, when they're trying to heal. It's worth noting there's no connection between the Sisters of Mercy Morris Industrial School for Indians and the University of Minnesota. Other than that, the university's present day campus in Morris is located on the same grounds as the boarding school was. The school was in operation from 1887 through 1909.